All right. So we're about to hear from my colleague and friend in the program, Andrew Mim. Andrew was born and raised in Napa Valley. After getting his bachelor's in environmental science at the University of Nevada, Reno, he realized his desire to pursue a career in the wine industry. He interned at Frank Family Vineyards in Calistoga, California, and then traveled to the Southern Hemisphere to work in the Australia's Yarra Valley the following spring. Andrew began, began the Viticulture and Enology Master's program in 2019, and after completion of the program, he'll be working at Inglenook in Rutherford, CA, and I, for one, am very happy to have him in the Napa Valley because I look forward to hopefully being able to pick his brain in industry for years and years to come because he's been a, a hugely important and impactful member of our uh, master's community thus far. So Andrew, without further ado, I'm excited to hear about Smoke Team. Thank you, Lauren. That was a nice introduction. All right. So uh, I know most of us are a little uh, burned out talking about smoke taint, but uh, today I'm excited to talk about what do we know about Y matrix effects on smoke taint expression. I got advising from, from Dr. Anita Oberholzer for this topic. So we'll start out with a summary. Um, an increase in wildfires has affected wine growers globally in recent years. Looking towards the future, and even right now, future climate models indicate that fire season will get more intense and longer. And how the wine matrix impacts smoke tan expression is poorly understood at this point. Although commonly, commonly referred to as an aftertaste, smoke tan is in reality a retronasal perception of flavor. So I explored seven key themes. Um, what is smoke tan and how can it be assessed? How do various fruit maturity levels impact smoke tan expression? How does the wine's alcohol percent impact volatility of smoke tan compounds? How do cultivar differences impact smoke tan expression? How do winemaking techniques influence the extraction of volatile phenols and subsequent intensity of smoke tan? How does wine aging impact smoke tan expression? And do threshold values have validity in establishing smoke tan risk? So what is smoke taint and how it can be assessed? Smoke taint research began in the early 2000s in Australia following bushfires during the growing season. Since then, gas chromatography mass spec me method has been validated by researchers. Smoke impact is a complex issue that is influenced by proximity to the fire, the analogical stage of the grapevines, wind patterns, topography, and other and types of biomass being burned being burned among other things. So during a wildfire, volatile phenols, we will call them VPs, are released from the burning of lignin. The important ones at this time are guaiacol, 4-methylguaiacol, uh, metacresol, paracresol, orthocresol, 4 methyl serendrol, and serendrol. And it's important to note that these are what we know at this time and there could be unknown smoke marker compounds that are important. So if, in order for these uh, compounds to enter the grapevine system, there are two potential pathways. Um, they could enter through passive diffusion via the berry cuticle and epidermis, or they could enter through the stomates in the leaf and be subsequently translocated to the fruit through the vascular system. And it is uh, generally accepted by researchers that um, smoke marker compounds, along with their glycosylated aroma precursors, are naturally found uh, in Vinifera. Also, um, we know smoke impacted wines can have a lot of smoky attributes that can be deemed unpalatable. The presence of smoke marker compounds is not always correlated with smoke flavor in smoke impacted grapes. Also, wines exposed to barrel aging are consistently found with levels of guaiacol, exceeding concentrations found in smoke tainted wine with no ashy aftertaste. So this really points to an intricate relationship between potentially known and or known and potentially unknown smoke related compounds within the unique wine matrix. So how do various fruit maturities level, fruit maturities impact the perception of smoke taint? As winemakers, we know that the date of harvest has a large impact on the quality and style of the wine being made. The impact of off flavor compounds such as VPs can be influenced by the level of fruit maturity it's been found. 
A study by Aristic investigated to the extent to which fruit maturity impacted the perception of smoke taint in Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, Merlot, and Shiraz. They did two distinct harvests. Harvest A were bricks for 16 to 20, and harvest B were more ripe at 22 to 25 bricks. So the descriptive analysis showed differences between the two harvests. Their enhanced fruit aromas and flavors that came from the riper fruit in harvest B, and the smoke attributes were somewhat diminished in harvest B wines. Interestingly, the levels of smoke taint seen in the pyrazine associated cultivars Sauvignon Blanc and Merlot have smoke attributes only apparent for Sauvignon Blanc or more intense for Merlot in early harvested fruit. McKay did an interesting wine matrix study recently. They added um, small concentrations of off flavors in various mixtures to a partially de-aromatized Shiraz wine. They added the compounds of guaiacol, orthopressyl, orethylphenol, and IBMP, methoxypyrazine. They found that wines with higher intensity of positive and fruity aromas contain fewer off flavors. And the outcome of mixtures of these compounds in the red wine tested cannot be predicted from the attributes of individual compounds. They saw some single compound attributes missing in binary mixtures and new attributes seen when the two compounds are present together. Also, compounds were not necessarily associated only with detection threshold levels. The aroma attribute ashtray was perceived only in binaries, which is known to be associated with smoke taint. If we look at the PC on the right, we see this combination here, the B00B. So this means below levels of guaiacol, zero levels of cresol, zero levels of forethophenol, and below levels of methoxypyrazine. And this combination is closest to the aroma attribute of ashtray. So the matrix effects of including methoxypyrazine at below threshold levels was found to significantly affect the aroma attribute ashtray, which is a pretty important finding. We can see that these other combinations all have methoxypyrazine and they're all close to the ashtray or herbaceous um, attribute. Another interesting finding is that when guaiacol and orthocresol are present together in solution, which is right here on the left line, the perception of sweet associated in floral slash violet aroma attributes are increased significantly. And this is interesting given that the descriptors for these two phenols individually could include things like burnt and smoky. So how does the wine's alcohol percent impact volatility of smoke tank compounds? A study by Harbertson showed that on Merlot wine that wine ethanol concentration has a bigger impact on the sensory profile than fruit maturity at harvest. Escudero found that the intensity of smell of a mixture of nine fruity compounds were shown to decrease with the amount of ethanol present in an alcoholic solution. Petroziello showed that a significant decrease in the volatility of ethyl phenols was seen with increased alcohol concentration. And they looked at 4-ethyl which is very similar in structure and aroma to 4-methyl So based off these findings, it may be hard to predict matrix effects where smoke taint flavors may be less volatile due to the high ethanol, but the fruit aromas can also decrease in this condition. So is higher ethanol a net positive is the question. An important study by Meyer in 2014 found that bacterial enzymes in the saliva are potentially responsible for the in-mouth release of bound volatile phenols. And he also showed that alcohol had a large impact on the in-mouth release of glycol with the release decreasing 39% to 6% with increasing ethanol levels in model wine. And I showed this uh, PCA from his study on the left here. And the main takeaway is that free, which are the triangles, and bound, which are the squares, and both, all these different combinations of compounds added to wine, um, they both, um, free and bound, contribute to smoke taint aroma attributes, such as smoky and medicinal. So uh, when you're worried about the wine you have to take into consideration of free and bound when tasting. So although consumer trends show that high alcohol wines of the past are starting to become less popular during smoke impacted years, production of higher alcohol wines could reduce the impact of smoke, tank volatility and potentially increase consumer acceptance. Moving on to cultivar differences. 
Anecdotal and scientific research show that smoke marker uptake and impact of VPs can be cultivar dependent. So it's well known that Shiraz contains substantially higher concentrations of volatile phenols naturally. And in research studies, um, they investigated Merlot, Shiraz, and Sangiovese and found that a higher concentration of free guacol was present in Sangiovese grapes and wine made from wildfire exposed grapes. And they had uh, 450 samples, so it was a pretty big study. So this uh, shows even within a cultivar, region and season may have an impact. So many factors may contribute to cultivar differences, such as vine health, hydric tendency, skin thickness, lenticel density, or other intrinsic genetic differences among cultivars. Of importance is uh, stomatal conductance, which has been shown to be potentially critical in influencing the absorption and biotransformation of smoke marker compounds into the grapevine system. And within cultivars, there are distinct flavors, such as TDN, a norisoprenoid, and Riesling, high levels of terpenes in cultivars such as Gewürztraminer, thio compounds, and Sauvignon Blanc. And all these have unknown matrix effects in smoke-impacted wines. It's going to be important to start testing for free inbound volatile phenols in non-smoke years to establish a baseline level. Going on to winemaking techniques. To mitigate risks, there are many known techniques that are already done and that are pretty easy. Things like removal of mog, hand harvesting, minimizing juicing during transport, keeping temperatures low during pressing, and keeping press fractions separate. All these will help minimize influence of smoke VPs. Use the enzymes to mitigate smoke taint has been investigated by Kennison. And they used the beta glucosidase and added it to free run Merlot juice. The results show that the volatile phenol concentration was increased by con converting the glycoconjugate phenols into their free volatile forms. And in the winery, this would be followed by activated carbon addition. Fudge studied activated carbon, a one grams per liter dose of FPS carbon used in smoke impacted Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot wines. And they found that the concentration of VPs in the wine were reduced significantly by uh, 58 to 71%. And importantly, in this study, um, wine quality parameters were not significantly affected. Wine color density saw a slight decrease that was not deemed significant. There was small or no loss of red wine pigments with wine color hue being unaffected, wine pH remaining constant and uh, TA decreasing slightly. The descriptive analysis after treatment showed that in this red wine study, they saw significantly reduced smoke related aroma attributes of smoke and cold ash. An enhancement of the fruit aroma and flavor was, was, was seen due to the wine matrix effects of reduced smoke aroma for both wines. So you could uh, have to think about how long do positive flavor changes last and you have to take in consideration slow hydrolysis during bottle aging in the equilibrium that forms between free and bound BP portions. So with all the smoke years that have happened in the past five years or so, at least in California, uh, winemakers are becoming very creative. Um, for white wine, the use of gentle hole cluster pressing up to half a bar with heavy bentonite clarification has been seen. And for red wine, some producers are choosing in smoke impacted years to produce a fully extracted red wine then assess treatment options. A treatment uh, regime using Napa is adding a glycosidase enzyme such as Zimron at three grams per hectare liter, followed by settling, a bench trial in FPS carbon, followed by settling, adding a sodic bentonite, um, and this is followed by racking and cross flow filtration to clarify and go in the barrel. Research by Anita has shown that Zimron actually only releases a small percentage of the bound VPs as it is a pectolytic enzyme and only has secondary glycosidase activity. In Oregon, a winemaker has experimented with whole milk finding, which is said to have a strong absorptive quality even in heavy smoke tainted wines. This is combined with phenol-free carbon finding and cross-fill filtration. Anecdotal results from that winemaker showed that bound for methylglycol was reduced by half in this method. Another technique is a smoke remediation wine column. 
using resins and it has spread through word of mouth recently. And another um, low tech technique is pressing red grapes immediately to tank and then adding smoke-free pumice when available to create a wine that is lower in smoke tank compounds and needs less treatment. So as we can see, winemakers are experimenting with many products and at this point, no processes has been found that will reduce most of the bound aroma precursors, unfortunately. And looking at finding agents, the success of them is wine matrix dependent. But in general, we see a decrease in smoke aroma initially and how this evolves during bottle aging is intriguing too. So moving on to wine aging and bottle aging. We know that bottle aging causes changes in the wine matrix. It softens in tannin, the fruit intensity and acidity, and it changes the mouthfeel and flavor in the wine. With smoke impacted fruit, the evolution of flavor is of interest to the known mechanism of a hydrolysis current of the bound glycosylated aroma precursors. A study looking at smoke impacted wines tested immediately post bottling in two and three years after bottling showed significant increases in glycol, in free glycol and four methyl glycol. So on this graph here, they have the various vineyard sites all throughout here and the uh, different cultivars. And I wanna focus in on Chardonnay because that's where they saw the largest increase in glycol from 2007 to 2010. They saw an increase in 200% in glycol in their Chardonnay and an increase in 300% in their Chardonnay for four methyl glycol. So this study um, made, made readily apparent that slow hydrolysis during bottle aging can occur. Research to study how the wine matrix impacts the rate of release of bound aroma precursors and looking at different wine matrices under variable bottle storage conditions would be useful. We know that wine age impacts the formation of aging bouquet and could increase levels of ethyl acetate and acid aldehyde that could cause additive or masking effects in the wine matrix. Uh, Ristic did a descriptive analysis on smoke affected wines that were bottle aged for five to six years. And they did an extensive analysis of VPs, both free and bound. And they found that glycoconjugates were more stable in wine conditions than in the previous study. And this could be due to wine matrix effects or variable smoke marker uptake in the grapes that were tested. In Ristic's study, uh, Sauvignon Blanc had intense fruity characters initially and saw an increase in smoke characters with post bottle aging. And it was seen that the wines with more prominent fruit characters showed less smoke, less intense smoke aroma. And this reinforced the notion that cultivar differences can have a significant influence on the expression of smoke taint due to the wine matrix being different in distinct cultivars and variable smoke marker uptake between cultivars. So do threshold values have validity in establishing smoke taint risk? Threshold values are used in sensory science to establish the minimum amount of a compound that can be detected or that produces a significant perceptible difference. And they have studied glaucol and it has a low sensory threshold and best estimate at 23 parts per billion in red wine. And it should be noted that threshold values are highly dependent on the wine matrix that it was tested. Parker did a study and found that in only five out of the 15 smoke tainted wine samples, glycol's reported threshold was eclipsed. The glycoconjugates released in mouth has been shown to be highly variable between individuals and this can further comp complicate threshold values. And the impact of residual sugar presence in the wine matrix has been shown to mask the effects of smoke taint expression for levels above three grams per liter and it decreases the glycol release, the presence of RS from 55% to 5% in the saliva. So having a little bit of RS is not a bad thing. Large scale consumer sensory studies are needed to assess what most individuals find acceptable in terms of smoke impact in different wine matrices. The AWRI investigated consumer acceptance in a smoke impacted Pinot Noir they had five versions of Pinot, an unaffected wine, an unaffected wine blended with three levels of a smoke affected wine and a 100% smoke affected wine. They use a nine point hedonic scale to assess overall liking with 82 regular consumers in a blind tasting setting. 
And results showed a highly significant difference among the wines with a strong negative correlation being seen with increasing levels of smoke affected wines. And only a minority of consumers did not respond negatively to smoke. And this is not surprising as about 20 to 25% of the population are anosmic to smoke according to the AWRI. So based off all this um, findings, I think threshold values do have limited validity in establishing smoke taint risks, but sufficient predictive accuracy would only be observed in the wine matrix that was tested. So I, again, I'm gonna emphasize that establishing baseline concentration levels during non-smoke years is important. So for significance, um, wildfires during the growing season, unfortunately will continue to happen and we're seeing an early start to the wildfire season this year. So it would be helpful to be able to predict risk of smoke taint based on the cultivar, wine style and winemaking techniques used. And due to the wine matrix complexity, only a few things are known about how the wine matrix affects expression of smoke taint. So number one, uh, more mature fruit more mature fruit can result in concentrated fruit aromas and higher potential alcohol that can potentially aid in masking smoke taint expression. Number two, in, in uh, cultivars with high concentrations of pyrazines, later picking dates or canopy management techniques will diminish the known matrix effects of pyrazines enhancing smoky aromas. And number three, the use in new barrels, especially with medium or higher toasts, will contribute more guacol, which may lead to more smoke attributes. So uh, in last year, we saw some wineries that skipped vintages in a whole. And I think the, I think we all know the economic feasibility of premium winemaking will suffer unless vineyards choose a process, then look at amelioration options. So looking to the future and where do we go from here? It starts with improving amelioration options um, implementing a vineyard mitigation and monitoring, monitoring strategy, such as identifying an, an effective agriculture barrier spray, using remote sensing to detect smoke taint risk, and implementing a regional early smoke detector network. Also, further investigating smoke marker compounds and the wine matrix effects, and developing a predictive smoke risk model with consumer input. All of these will be vital to the continued success of the wine industry in a climate change world. So for my acknowledgements, I'd like to thank Dr. Anita Oberholzer for incredible help on this topic. I'd like to thank Dr. Cantu and the entire Venn faculty during my time in the department. I'm thankful to my parents and my girlfriend, Leia. I wanna give a special shout out to the Roots Fund for their support and work in advancing um, opportunities for minority wine professionals. And I'm thankful to the funding sources of Naked Wines, James Beard Foundation, Gergit Hills Estate, Wine Spectator, John C. Cole Memorial Fund, Devo, and Jastro Shield Stipend. And finally, I am very thankful for my classmates for the past two years and the friendships that we have formed. So that is it. And if there's any questions, please ask. Thanks, Andrew. That was awesome. I'm just okay. curious if there are other wine regions that I should pay attention to um, outside of the Western US that have issues with wildfires and smoke taint. Oh, yeah. Um, Australia, um, all throughout Australia from Victoria, New South Wales, Western Australia, South Australia. Australia is a continent that is prone to burn and um, South Africa as well has had some issues and um, I'm not sure, it's, it's been more rare in the Mediterranean European countries, but it's mainly us in uh, Australia and South Africa, and maybe some in uh, Canada and the Okanagan region. Hey, uh, Andrew, I'm curious, you mentioned the barrier sprays. I'm just wondering um, what for that is on the market or research or where, we are with those really. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, there's two interesting ones right now. Um, in Australia, they identified Kaidosan and particularly um, the Aspergillus fungus form of Chidosan, and that has been shown to reduce uh, guacol and form of guacol by up to, I think it was about 60% for both. And um, 
So that's something that, that could be looked at and it's already approved for use in the vineyard, I believe. And another interesting one in some researchers at the University of British Columbia, they um, tested a couple of different ones and they identified um, an artificial grape cuticle. Um, the brand name is Biofilm and it has been shown to be strongly effective uh, and it's applied one week uh, post foration and it does a really good job of keeping out the smoke BPs. And something interesting for that is they're, they tested a tea tree oil and some, the tea tree oil for that study actually increased the uptake of smoke BPs by like 50%. So you have to be careful what you're spraying during a smoke impacted years. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, thank you, great, uh, great presentation. Thank you. Congrats, Andrew. That was really good. Um, I was just wondering about like the smoke detector network that you were talking about. To me, I feel like you could look at the sky and see if there's smoke, but like I wanted to know like if there was more details and um, you know how how that would work. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks for asking about the vineyard things because I think that's really important. It's where we should start get it get the grapes into the winery with the least amount of smoke as possible. Um, so in Australia. Uh, in Victoria, they have set out, they've set up regional detectors of smoke in different setups. And uh, Dr. Ian Porter of La Trobe has been really helpful in doing that setup. So what they have is, they call it a VESDA, that's the brand name of smoke detector, and that can detect the dose of the smoke. And right next to that, they have a, a tube that has a absorptive quality. So and the volatile phenols can go into the tube, then eventually they will test the tube and uh, quantify the volatile phenols using um, the gas chromatography mass spec method. So I, I think it's something that should really be looked at in Northern California because um, the setup of these smoke detectors, there's already a blueprint for it. And I think it'd be really helpful because a lot of vineyard growers, they just kind of want to know, should I pick or not during smoke impacted years? And that's pretty gray right now. So if we could um, have regional detectors throughout maybe different AVAs or even more widely, I think it'd be important in giving growers and winemakers another tool in their ability to uh, predict smoke taint. And the results from the Australia smoke detector network are uh, pretty promising. So I think that's something that should be looked at here. I'm sorry, what was the brand name that you said? It was a Vesda smoke detector. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Andrew, is smoke taint much of an issue in any of the, the regions you mentioned and Dr. Elberhoster just mentioned a decade ago? Um, in Australia, yeah, there definitely was. Um, there is this one fires, I believe it was 2007 in the Yarra Valley. And one of the study that I looked at, um, looked at um, vineyards from that wildfire event. And that was a really um, devastating wildfire with a lot of loss of life, unfortunately. And when I was in, when I worked in Australia, I worked in the Yarra Valley and my classmate, or sorry, my roommate, he had experience with that when he was a kid. So. Yeah, there definitely was uh, wildfires that have occurred 10 years ago in Australia. And I think for us in California, it's only happened. I mean, the big one was starting in 2017 and it might have happened before then, but 2017 is when we really got alerted to the issue. And of course, last year. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? If not, I think it is time. Congrats, Great you guys yeah. and Lauren. Great job, both. Yeah. Thank you. You made us proud, which is good. <laughs> good. Okay, guys, take care and see you. See you soon. Yeah. Well done, guys. Congratulations. <clears throat>